Hello all, this is the Owl, and Merry Spookmas, oh boy, do I have something special for you today. Within the modern landscape of horror manga, there are a few names you'll hear over and over again on every single listicle or ranking video, and one of those names is another which is often stated to have been inspired by the Final Destination films, although honestly I do not see that much of it. It's more of a somewhat gory horror mystery, centered around a small group of adolescent characters in a specific environment. And yeah, that could describe maybe half of all horror manga. The blood and guts are decent and used sparingly enough that it always stays impactful. The art is fine, and the core mystery, while not quite at something of the level of Umineko or Higurashi. Yes, I do plan on marrying my darling Higurashi one day, thank you for asking, is pretty solid. Yeah, as you can probably tell, I really like this story. I can't say that I adore it, it does rely on a few storytelling contrivances that I'm not really a fan of, and the solution to the mystery is both somehow a little too heavily telegraphed and completely bonkers. Oh, and it has the corpse party problem of introducing so many characters that look really similar, that one rather important character or at least something to do with her, could easily slip you by. But yeah, it's certainly solid, and as we'll see later, it might just be quite a bit smarter than it seems on the surface. So, does another live up to the hype of being one of the great modern Japanese horror stories? Well, let's find out. Today, we'll be taking a deep dive into the manga adaptation and trying to decipher just why this little yarn has had such a powerful impact on readers both at home and abroad. Another started life as a novel written by Ayatsuji Yukito. This dude is pretty fascinating as he generally does old-fashioned detective stories, and he's married to Fuyumi Ono. If that name sounds familiar, you might know her from her own manga series, such as the mediocre Supernatural Investigation series Ghost Hunt, and the really good and really depressing small-town vampire yarn Shiki, or as I like to call it, you'll never look at a tractor the same way again. Ayatsuji is a huge critic of the modern manga scene, as he sees them as flat and lacking in any sort of important social commentary. Which, hmm, another can be read in a few different ways. On the surface, it's a straight-up supernatural mystery. However, there's also a way to read it, as a metatextual critique of certain societal issues in Japan. We'll get to that later. And before we start, a few quick things. Firstly, yes, like most of those on the weeb spectrum, I've seen the anime adaptation, but that was donkey's years ago, and I only have the fuzziest recollection of it. So... I am not going to be spending much time comparing the manga to the anime. Cliff notes, the anime is quite a bit gorier, has a lot more action, and does explain one of the most confusing aspects of the story a bit more clearly. But on the other hand, it loses a lot of the interesting subtext, one character is completely botched, and the mystery isn't as cleverly set up. It's still a damn fine adaptation, and of course, has an absolute banger of an OST. Secondly, as I've said, another contains a certain subtext, 
And going through that subtext is going to necessitate me being somewhat critical about certain aspects of contemporary Japanese culture, particularly schooling. And as I've learned from my Chainsaw Man series, there are some viewers who take issue with this and assume that this must mean I hate Japan and every aspect thereof. Ugh, let me get this straight. Right now, I spent most of my adult life living in Japan. I have a deep and abiding affection for the place, its peoples, and its culture. But that does not mean Japan isn't occasionally really messed up. And some of these nasty pointy bits are, at least I think, a big part of what Ayatsuji was driving at with his story. Again, we will go into this a bit later. Finally, to cap off this overlong rambly intro, I will say this much at the outset. This is a great manga, and different enough from the anime to easily justify a purchase even if you've seen it. It's also a great big twisty ball of mystery, characters, murky motivations, and red herrings. So, if you haven't seen either, then I'd highly recommend watching this video, then reading the manga yourself, then coming back for part two when it comes out. Because while there aren't too many spoilers here, part two is where the answers to the mystery will start being pooped out. Okay? Okay. With that out of the way, we've got a lot to look at here both in terms of the story and in terms of authorial intent. So let's dive on in. Our story opens with a nifty little bit of foreshadowing. Two students are discussing an urban legend about Class 3-3 at their school, after a popular student called Misaki died in an accident, the class pretended he was still alive. I must say, I love the coloration here. The art in this manga varies from meh to bloody amazing for the era, but I wish the entire thing looked like this. The simple use of shades of red added to the black and white creates an incredibly eerie and surreal mood that, yeah, the anime did try to emulate somewhat. Our actual story begins in the town of... <laughs> what? Yomiyama? Ugh. Okay, Ayatsuji, that's ridiculous. Huh. Okay, see. Yama means mountain, and Yomi refers to the gloomy land of the dead within the Shinto faith. That's so on the nose for this story that it's like calling Derry, Maine, Clownville, the Spencer Mansion, Zombie House, or those magazines under your bed. I have no idea where those came from. We meet our protagonist, Koichi Sakakibara, who is about to finish up a lengthy hospital stay due to a collapsed lung which was apparently a complication brought on by intense stress. His father moved to India for work, and he's moved out here to the boonies in order to stay with his dead mother's relatives and to attend Yomiyama Middle School. I have to wonder if he's based on the protagonist of Higurashi, Keiichi Maibara, as they do share a basic appearance Although, to be fair, that's just how every horror manga protagonist looks, I think. They've got very similar sounding names, and even have pretty similar backstories. Yes, Higurashi, Slurp, Slurp, Nom Nom, etc. We'll get there, as promised, at 10k. Oh boy, get ready for a 10-parter there. We also meet Mizuno. Hello, nurse. This hotty hot 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 who appears to have the hots for Koichi in turn. And yes, I know, I'm going to call him Keiichi at least once in this review. 
Also, lady. He's like, what, 13, 14? Oh, Japan, never change. Soon, he is visited by two of his future classmates, Kazami and Sakuragi, who've come to say hi, but they also start asking him some very odd questions, particularly where he's from, whether he's from here or has ever visited for very long. Mate... If they start talking about a cotton drifting festival or Oyashiro Sama, it's time to bloody leg it. Anyway, the students depart, and after a bit of slapstick comedy with Mizuno, Koichi heads out too. And on his way, he spots a strange, sad looking girl with an eye patch. She seems unwilling to speak with him but does identify herself as Mei Misaki. Hey, isn't that the family name of the dead student from the urban legend? Huh. And yes, like any really good mystery, we are already setting up a bunch of clues, red herrings, and foreshadowing. Honestly, like Higarashi, this might be one to go through with a pen and paper if you want to solve the mystery before the characters do. We next see Koichi at home. Turns out that he's actually staying with his stunningly beautiful aunt on his mother's side, Reiko. She's actually a really likable character and the two chit-chat about the school he's about to attend. Specifically, the various superstitions at the school. Yeah, basically every school in Japan above maybe elementary school level has a good few of these. Don't go into the gym after hours, or you'll do badly on the next test. Always bow to the statue of the first principal on your way out, or your parents will get a divorce. Don't go drinking with the geography teacher or you'll end up pregnant, that sort of thing. Here, however, there's one strange one. You must abide by the will of the class or else. That's ominous. We also see that Reiko has a pet. I think that's a minor bird called Rei. Oh yeah. You should be taking notes, because while Ayatsuchi isn't really that scary, he knows story structure and how to construct a very tight mystery. And one of the most important rules when it comes to crafting a mystery is that you have to set it up in a way where the reader could foreseeably figure out the answer before the characters do. So pay attention, that bird is kind of important, and it's one element that I don't even think was in the anime, more's the pity, because this is pretty clever. And let me say at this point that I am not going to go over every single clue we're given, or every bit of foreshadowing, or every red herring, because this is going to be long enough. Again, this is a manga to absolutely pick up for yourself. And there's even a proper omnibus edition that's not very hard to track down. At school, Koichi meets a few more characters. First up, their homeroom teacher, Kubodera, and their assistant teacher, Mikami. Oh yeah, this character is easily the most confusing part of the story, but we'll get into the whys later even though I don't think it's a massive spoiler exactly. On entering 3-3, he immediately notices a very odd atmosphere, and after he sits down, he spots a familiar eye-patched face. The weird, sad girl with the doll from the hospital. Another new character, Teshigawara, is friends with Kazami, and together, they form that trope duo. You know, the serious, studious boy and his horny slacker friend. But their hello has another purpose, and they ask Koichi 
if he believes in the supernatural, which weirds him out, understandably. Outside, after class, he spots May sitting alone. He walks over and tries to strike up a conversation to which she warily asks if he's sure about what he's doing. Zer? And then she walks off, telling him to watch out. We also get a few more indications from Sakuragi that 3-3 is a very weird class, as apparently they do everything alone. She wants to tell him something else, something that sounds quite important, but chickens out at the last second. Koichi tries to ask her about Mei, to which she responds with an expression of abject terror as a sudden peal of thunder rings out. What the hell? Koichi finds Mei up on the school roof, but she's still unwilling to speak with him and switches the topic to his name, wondering if he's being bullied because of it. Okay, this is interesting because I think she's talking about the infamous so-called Kobe child murders, where a 14-year-old student acting under the alias of Seito Sakakibara killed two other students in ways that I probably can't go into on YouTube. Seito Sakakibara then acted in a very Jack the Ripper-esque campaign of terror, sending letters to newspapers taunting them and the police. He also wrote a sort of manifesto in which he blamed the killings on the Japanese education system where he had been bullied and made to feel invisible. That's, oh man, that's some really clever and rather subtle foreshadowing. Remember this moving forwards. Anyway, Mei tells him that Zakaki Bara is a cursed name as it's associated with a wretched death of school kids, and also tells him that, at this school, 3-3 is the class closest to death. You know, I wonder, with all the on-the-nose symbolism that Ayatsuchi seems fond of, that this wasn't class 3-4, you know, with 4 being the unlucky Japanese number due to it being a homonym with death. But the number three is, I guess, associated with curses, so that might be it. Although here I might be overthinking things. We also get one of the most iconic spreads in the manga, as Mei warns Koichi that bad things are coming, and he needs to be ready for them, and then she buggers off. What an odd little duck. Anyway. We're going to start getting into the meat of the story soon, and before we do that, I really want to give you my own theory on exactly what Ayatsuji's authorial intent was here. In simpler terms, exactly why this story is how it is. So, yay! Pull up a chair, because it's time for another patented Fright Ranker ramble on weird Japanese shit. Let's get it out of the way. Okay. So, as I said at the start of the video, another isn't just a pretty decent horror mystery. It can also be read as a deep metacultural critique of some of Japan's more jagged edges, and this is going to take a bit of explaining. Firstly, wa. No, that's not just the sound you make when you jump scare your older sister. In Japan, wa refers to maintaining peace, tranquility, and societal harmony generally by shutting up and doing what everyone else is. About the closest Western equivalent would be don't rock the boat, or maybe more accurately, 
I understand that one of your students put broken glass into your school lunch and slashed your bike tires because they thought it'd be funny, but is that any reason to make a fuss? Secondly, so Japanese school life might be a bit difficult for folks overseas to really grasp. It all looks fine and calm on the surface, wa, remember, but see, the way we perceive university, Japan sees high school. The way we see high school, Japan kind of sees middle school. While getting the job you want in the West usually comes down to bust your ass in the final year of high school, get into a good university, and then you're golden, in Japan, you won't even get near the university you want unless you get into the right high school. By this, I mean that Japanese high schools are quite specialized in their way. For stuff like law, medicine, science, and the like, students will travel from all over Japan to try and get into the handful of schools that feed these careers. And, as you could probably imagine, competition is fierce, meaning that middle school is a bit of a hellscape. A day in the life of a middle school student who, say, wants to become a doctor, by which I generally mean their parents insist they become a doctor, is absolutely bonkers. These kids get to school at maybe 6 a.m. for club practice. School starts at 8 and finishes at around 3, after which students immediately begin practicing clubs again until the evening. Then they either attend extra classes or cram school. Then they go home at night, do homework and study while eating dinner, sleep, and then get up the next day and do the exact same thing again. Weekends and holidays are wall-to-wall -wall club practice and cram school, and the schools play into this somewhat, with more specialized, stricter academic schools imposing really weird rules on students, such as not playing video games, not going to see movies, not going to karaoke, and the like. It's so bad that seeing kids falling asleep in the middle of class is not only common, but completely acceptable. And this frankly unhealthy experience continues right through high school, after which university is admittedly a bit of a wank. Getting into a good university is what's important, not necessarily what you do once you're there. But yeah, it's a lot of pressure. Right at the start, of the tumultuous period of adolescence. Because if you don't go all out in middle school and get into that specific high school you need and instead wind up at an agricultural school or even a merely decent local public school, you've got more of a chance of winning the lottery than getting into Tohoku or Tokyo Dai, no matter what your grades look like. And add to this, these schools are often far away, so there are a lot of kids that, at the start of high school or even sometimes middle school, will move across the country to stay with a relative near that high school or even live alone in a cheap apartment, which is not uncommon in high school. And yeah, kids in middle school stress like hell about this. So. We've got stress, ordeal, plus isolation from home, which, as we know from basic psychology, as in the cases of war, prison, or getting stranded somewhere, it tends to bond folks together pretty strongly. Thus, individuals within a specific class in Japan tend to develop a powerful group identity based on that class. In many cases, making friends for life, watched over by their homeroom teacher who, in many cases, becomes more of a parent to their students than their actual parents do, often with equal or even superseding authority. Unfortunately, 
This has an even darker side when you put all of this together. In, I'd say about half the classes I encountered in Japan, there's always that one kid that everyone hates and bullies the crap out of. It's sadly usually a girl, and trust me, simply being excluded and ignored isn't even the worst of it. And this is, despite the almost monthly assemblies and lectures about bullying, generally just shrugged off by the teachers. Wah, remember? Thinking back, I recall an experience in my first year in Japan, where I saw this happening in real time, to the extent that a female student literally stopped coming to school and became a shut-in at home. Disgusted, I reported this to my supervisor and gave the names of some of the students spearheading the ostracization and cruelty towards this girl. Said teacher brushed me off, and then when I pushed the issue, took me out on an evening and, over beer and ramen, explained that this was all necessary. She called the student the class kidney and said that all the stress and negative energy of the class has to go somewhere, and better it all be poured into a single victim than being turned loose where it can become antisocial behavior or disruption of the school as a whole. The student becomes, in essence, a societally acceptable sacrifice for the greater good. Yeah, Japan's not all Pokemon and Pochitas. So, what was the point of that ramble? Well, as we move forwards in the story, I want you to keep it in mind. With that, let's take a short break. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. And we're back, as is Koichi attending school the next day. He is making friends with Teshigawara, but there is a rather threatening atmosphere here, especially when he asks about Mei, which prompts his new buddy to coldly ask him if he's feeling alright and walk away looking perturbed. Koichi then runs into Mikami-sensei, who offers him an umbrella. Oh, thanks, Freddy Foreshadowing. The next day, we meet, uh, yet another new character who looks far too similar to the other characters. His name is Mochizuki, and he's holding a bit of a chubby for Mikami-sensei, the assistant teacher of their class. <laughs> In my school, it was always the computer's teacher, Ms. van der Merwe. Oh, Miss Fundamava, you and your black stockings with those little red ribbons. Whoa. Why the hell did you have to go and marry a guy that looks like Marlon Brando from the island of Dr. Moreau? Wait, where was I? Oh, right. We get another clever little bit of metatextual patterning as the two discuss the scream. You know, that famous painting of Ghostface. And Mochizuki tells him that it's a painting that evokes anxiety, and that this sort of fear doesn't go away just because you pretend it isn't there. Yeah, that's another clever little bit of foreshadowing to keep in mind, at least thematically, as we move forwards. They're interrupted by Teshi Gowara, who wants to tell Koichi something important, but Mochizuki sadly tells him that it's too late now and he can't. Koichi, spotting Mei again, tells them that he's off-ski to speak with her, to which they respond with, again, a great deal of unease. Yeah, there's something about this girl that's a bit threatening to the other students. Mei is initially reluctant to speak with him, warning him that this is going to piss off the other students, 
but she gradually relaxes when he asks her about her eye patch. He's surprised as she, for just an instant, actually smiles and looks like a normal girl. But then he buggers it up being awkward, and before he can dig himself any deeper, the conversation is broken up, seemingly deliberately by another teacher. Yeah, what the hell is going on here? After a brief interlude with his aunt, we cut forward to school the next day and meet another character, yeah. although this one is actually somewhat important to the plot. Her name is Izumi, but we won't find that out for a bit. We then, I think, cut back in time a bit to the morning and see a very brief glimpse of Koichi's grandmother, but again, Note the bird and what it's saying, its own name, Rei, and why. Yeah, I'm not sure when exactly these scenes are taking place, but we also see Koichi at the hospital, chatting up Mizuno again. You remember the cute nurse that may very well have a massive thing for him. He's curious about Mei and what exactly she was doing here. Mizuno says that a young patient died, and she agrees to investigate more for him. That's wildly inappropriate on a few levels, but I'll allow it. She soon gets back to him, saying that it was a girl called Misaki or Masaki. And yeah, I'm just going to breeze through most of this side plot, as it's not all that interesting or relevant. About the only important thing here is that, okay, this isn't really fleshed out well, but it's the start of Koichi's theory that Mei is a ghost. Yeah, this'll make sense later. He remembers seeing her going into a specific shop, which turns out to be some kind of doll studio. After speaking to the creepy old lady owner, he explores and finds this in the basement a doll that looks exactly like Mei in a coffin. Yeah, dude, this is where you get out, but too late. Mei shows up and yeah, it's a bit awkward. Koichi, you look like a stalker, but they do chat and she tells him that, hmm, interesting. I don't hate it here. Japanese people, especially women, don't typically like to say strong things and it's often viewed as more dignified to say, I don't dislike X than I like X. It's just an odd quirk of the culture. Anyway, they get talking, and May reveals that her eye patch conceals a blue glass eye, which apparently can see the supernatural. Um, okay then, I'd love to know why Japan has such a fascination with eye powers. Mei is evasive when he asks her about the coffin and her hospital visit, but eventually she explains a bit about what the hell is going on at school. She goes over the legend of Misaki again, the dead boy we learned about at the start of the story. After his death, his class pretended that he was still alive with the school's full permission and endorsement. And then, weird stuff started happening. In particular, the class photo seemed to show an extra student who looked a lot like Misaki. Koichi senses that this is just the start of the story, but I'm guessing more for the sake of pacing. Mei cuts him off, as it's already bloody late, and he heads home, confused and a bit uneasy. Oh, don't worry, mate. The confusion has only begun. Back at school, Koichi and his chums are talking about the school trip a massive deal for middle schoolers, as it is, for many of them, the first time they get a decent amount of free time, spending money, 
and even some independence. It's always in the third year to help kids decompress a bit from the stress of their crucial upcoming exams that will, in a big way, determine what they can do with the rest of their lives. Most schools go to Tokyo, and the trip is capped off with a visit to either Disneyland or USJ. Except here, Koichi is told that 3-3 goes in their second year rather than their third, which is very odd. He also asks them about the Misaki ghost story, which causes them to panic, but they're interrupted by, oh, this girl again, Izumi Akazawa. She is your stereotypical mean girl, and is going to be very important to the plot, so remember her. At home later, he learns that his dead mother was in class 332. Oh, and as he's now decided to solve this freaky mystery, wants to know where her yearbook is. He also tries to talk to his Aunt Reiko about the story, but like everyone else, she's evasive and finally shuts him down, telling him that this is something he's better off not knowing. Ugh, that may be true, but you don't understand how people work, do you, Ducky? You should know full well that this is only going to encourage him. The next day at school, May isn't there, and he asks a few folks where she is. When he gets a phone call from Teshigawara, who tells him that, even though talking to him about this might get him in the poo with Izumi, he is going to do it anyway, and tells Koichi that he needs to drop this and stop paying attention to things that aren't there. In return, he promises to explain things to him next month. You know, if you people weren't so bloody mysterious about this whole thing, it would likely help. He goes home and wonders about all of this. If May doesn't actually exist, it would sort of make sense. May Misaki died at the hospital, and he's been chatting with and chilling with a ghost. Yeah, it's a fun theory, but mate, we're not even halfway through the manga, so this can't be the solution. And sure enough, this is soon proven to be wrong, as Mizuno calls him up and says that the dead girl's first name was Misaki, not her family name. Yeah, Japan can be confusing like this sometimes. She also tells him that the girl's last name was Fujioka. This was all a bit of a red herring, or was it? Yeah, again, this is one of two little side plots that are built up as massive mysteries, and while the actual conclusion of this one is bug nuts insane, it's actually not terribly relevant to the core plot. At school, I'm guessing the next day, Koichi runs into Mei again, and she tells him, that the dead girl, the other, other Misaki, was her cousin. Huh. She also finally explains a bit about why she's being bullied like this, saying that, to everyone else, she's invisible, and that Koichi is the only one that sees her. <laughs> Girly, you do know that he thinks you might be a ghost, right? Saying things like this are not helping your case. And yeah, see what I mean about the art. Sometimes it looks a bit like arse, but sometimes it's really great. I love the sketchy, high contrast look that it goes for. Lots of blacks and shadows. It really helps to cultivate a sinister, mysterious atmosphere. Sakuragi spots them starts walking over, realizes that they're talking, and freaks out. Before we see that, huh, she's just been told that her family has been in an accident. Oof. And yes, 
people who've watched the anime are going, oh, it's that bit. Yeah, let's get to it. Thrown into a panic, Sakuragi flees through the corridors, tries to head down a flight of stairs, trips and holy balls! I'm man popping, y'all! Falls right down onto the pointy bit of her umbrella. It punches clear through her trachea and out the back of her neck. Wow, this manga just escalated really fast. And this nutty butty scene marks the end of the first volume. Volume 2 opens with another gorgeous few colour pages. Once again, it's some kids gossiping. Something's happening. Some sort of phenomenon involving someone in the class, or someone related to them, dying in some awful, unexpected manner once a month. Ah, so that's why Teshikawara said next month. Koichi is resting at home. Seeing Sakuragi pull a reverse Mary Poppins has caused his lung issue to flare up again, and he's been out of school for a week. Turns out that Sakuragi's mother, also carked it in the accident, and Izumi, ooh, that's not a good face. Yeah, spot our primary antagonist. We also learn that Tejigawara has been ghosting Koichi, lol. So he goes out for a meal with, well, Japanese Mrs. Robinson here, and explains all the weirdness going on. She agrees to see what she can learn, and heads off. Rather than going home, Koichi finds himself visiting the Weird Doll Studio again, where he naturally runs into Mei. She confirms that, uh, it is happening. Whatever the bloody hell it is. Yay for the pronoun game. That's a bad one. And of course, she still refuses to clarify, implying that if he knew, he would probably start ignoring her too. I think that there's a further implication here that despite her cold nature, she really enjoys the fact that he's speaking with her and is avoiding telling him things not just because of his own safety, but because, well, if he knew what was going on, he would probably ostracize her too. She also tells him that she is going to be avoiding school for a bit, to watch his back, and not to tell anyone that they talked. Koichi, at home later, mulls all of this over, and realizes that his mother's yearbook might be in Building Zero, an abandoned part of the school with an old library. Just, yeah, watch out for little girls in red dresses. He also speaks with Reiko a bit more about her brushing him off regarding his questions earlier, but she says that she has no memory of this. Again, take note, turns out that Reiko was also in 3-3, and has only the foggiest memory of her experiences there. Koichi himself tries to think back to that time when he was quite young, but finds that he also can't remember, and even trying to suddenly makes him feel uncomfortable. Don't worry, like so many things, this will actually make sense later. Then, to his horror, Reiko suddenly starts talking like the bird, Rei, and saying, Why? Yeah, knock it off. That's weird. At school, nobody has acknowledged Sakuragi's death, all except for Izumi, who is furious with Koichi for some reason. She seems to blame him for her friend's death, and yeah, again, when the art here tries, it's very decent. Koichi is able, however, to finally corner Teshigawara, who's been dodging him, and tells him that he needs to tell him the rest of the story about Misaki, as 
her his promise. Hishigawara is reluctant, but before Koichi can try to persuade him, he gets a call from Mizuno. She's been looking around and has come to the conclusion that Mei does not actually exist. She does say that she asked her younger brother about this, and while he also denied that there was any such person as Mei Misaki, he did seem utterly terrified. Koichi tells her that Mei definitely exists, but before she can respond, the elevator she's in suddenly breaks free of its mountings, and yeah, in a very Final Destination scene, plummets down, smashing Mizuno to pieces. Bloody hell! And ah, I liked Mizuno. Sometime later, at home, Koichi asks his grandparents if they want to go to Mizuno's funeral, and holy crap, that is a gorgeous panel. And, <laughs> okay, here's something for you manga fans, and be warned, you're never going to be able to unsee this. What you're looking at here is almost certainly a technique that you start to see in the 90s. I think Gantz was one of the first to make it work decently, and now you see it pretty frequently, especially in seinen. Or I guess the seinen like shonen, for example Tokyo Ghoul. That entire lovely backdrop, that is actually a photograph. The photograph will get digitized, in many cases traced over, and then composited into the panel. It's a technique that's actually a bit like rotoscoping, and while it is frowned on in certain circles, I've always thought it looked great. One sign to look for is a white border around characters and anything else that's clearly drawn in. And now, yeah, you will never be able to unsee this. Haha. <laughs> Anywho, another clue to take note of. Koichi's seldom seen grandfather says that he doesn't want to go to the funeral as he's been to too many as of late. Lying in bed, Koichi thinks back to something, something he can barely recall. A formal occasion involving his father, his grandparents, and a photograph of someone that, yeah, I'm not going to spoil anything here, but if you go back and look at this once you finish the manga, you'll realize that it actually gives the entire game away. But it's done in such a manner that you probably won't notice it on your first time through. Nicely done, Ayatsuji. I'll give you this. The mystery in this story is handled pretty damn well. At school, Koichi is walking with Mei when he realizes that the other students are gossiping about him and shooting him filthy looks, especially Izumi. Yeah, watch out mate, that one is trouble. He's still on his may might actually be a ghost kick, and wonders if they're actually seeing him walking along, chatting away with fresh air. Later, Mochizuki, that kid with the boner for Mikami-sensei, the assistant teacher we met earlier, asks Koichi if she's okay. How the hell would he know? And, ah, uh, alright. This is handled very poorly in the manga, and is built up a lot more in the anime, but I don't really understand why this has to be a mystery, as it's not that big of a reveal, and it doesn't really connect to the core mystery all that much, and knowing it, will help you be way less confused later. So, you know what? Bollocks to it. I am going to spoil this now. You know Koichi's aunt Reiko? Her last name is Mikami. Yup. The hot teacher is his hot aunt, Mikami Sensei. Again, it's not that important to the plot, and I have no idea 
why this is set up as such a mystery. Anyway, in the library, he asks that creepy teacher from earlier about his mother, making a pretty good excuse by saying that he wants to try drawing her in art class. And yes, there is kind of an art theme running through this manga, but I don't really understand why. It's never especially plot relevant. We do get a bit more information about Koichi's mother though, in that her name was Ritsuko, and that the librarian knew her. But she died right after Koichi was born, and yeah, this dude is acting just as shifty as all the others. However, before Koichi can investigate further, he is called to see the counsellor, where he learns that Mizunor's death was a freak accident. Yeah, I think we gathered that, stemming from simple misfortune. Okay, a lot of people have said that these deaths are supposed to be very Final Destination-esque, but I don't really see it, to be honest. There are no Heath Robinson-esque chain reactions it's just bad luck. Maybe this is more pronounced in the anime I do not remember. Oh, except for that one scene, which, yeah. We'll get to that next time. You'll see what I mean. Koichi returns to class and finds it completely deserted. Dude, maybe they're all ghosts. Maybe you're the ghost. He does notice that May's desk is really old and really crappy, which annoys him as it seems to be additional mistreatment. But he does see that May's carved a phrase into the desk. Who is the casualty? That's weird. Their homeroom teacher, this seriously Ayatsuji, it's not fair if you make everyone in the story a creeper, tells him that Izumi is going to be the new class rep, and reminds him of the rule. He needs to abide by whatever the class decides. And, a bit more sinister, the implication here is that the class deliberately met together in a secret location designed to exclude him from said meeting. Uh-oh. Sure enough, Mochizuki visits him at home and tells him that things are about to get rough for him. That secret class meeting was indeed about him and that he can't say any more. Worse yet, another student who we haven't met died at home of a freak heart attack. The mysterious deaths are continuing to occur. At school the next day, Koichi quickly realizes that, yup, everyone is ignoring him, much as they did to Mei. So this is what Mochizuki was talking about. And remember that subtext I mentioned earlier? Mm-hmm, something else I've seen in practice. If the class decides to ostracize someone, and you go and talk to said outcast or try to befriend them, they will do the exact same thing to you. Koichi decides to test it out. Good man. He sees that Teshigawara is pointedly ignoring him, so he grabs him by the shoulder. But Izumi tells him to stop being silly and responding to things that aren't there. Yeah, this is your doing, isn't it, you little psychopath? But you know, if this was me, I'd have some fun with it and act the fool. Let's see you ignore me when I run around the class throwing balloons filled with dog poop at you douche nozzles. Also, give me 50 bucks and full marks on every test, or I will be as disruptive as possible. Assholes. But yeah, Koichi twigs onto what's going on pretty fast, and finds a message from Teshigawara, apologizing for all of this and telling him to talk to his aunt slash assistant teacher about exactly what's happening and why. And yeah, before we finish off today's episode, this is pretty clever, as we see that all of this has backfired onto the class somewhat, despite them pretending 
that Mei doesn't exist, to the point that Koichi thought she was a ghost, the fact that they are now treating him the same way proves that she does exist. Yeah. Didn't think that one through, did you? And this in turn allows him to finally get a bit closer to Mei, as now they're both ostracized together. Turns out Mei and her aunt, the old lady who runs the doll studio, live on the third floor of the building above it. And finally, now that they can talk freely, we start getting the full story. And okay, this next bit is very complicated and, if I'm being honest, a bit clumsily told. So I am going to have to jump around a bit here. Let me do my best. Right, Cliff Notes version. After the original Misaki died, the other students pretended he was still alive, to the extent that it got very weird and rather morbid. They'd set up a desk for him, they'd have conversations with him, they'd even pretend to be walking home with him. And gradually, this was followed by some odd occurrences, including the photograph we saw earlier as if there was really another person, an extra person, in the class. And this caused some sort of curse to fall over 3-3. Then the death started. Freak accidents that claimed the life of students and other family members. Anyone within a certain radius of Yomiyama, who is either in class 3-3 or is up to two steps of genetic relation to someone from the class, seems to be fair game for horrible, tragic fates. They tried moving the class, they tried exorcisms, did you maybe try not calling it 3-3, and maybe calling it something like, I don't know, 3-6, because that'd be my first thought. Regardless, nothing they tried worked. And this trend continued for years, with them gradually discovering a few things about what was going on. 3-3 would, from time to time, be infiltrated by an extra student, a ghost of some kind. And as soon as this started happening, the deaths would begin again. However, this marked a turning point. They discovered a way to fend off or at least contain this strange curse, creating a scapegoat for the extra students, choosing a class member and ostracizing them, literally acting like they do not exist, which, in a way, balanced the books to account for the ghost. If this was done correctly, and if there are no deaths for a few months, they can end the ostracization, ease up, and this becomes an off year, a year with no deaths. But of course, the next 3-3 class will have to continue this ritual. And on and on it went. Every year, the class choosing a scapegoat, and yes, I had to re-record that a few times as I kept saying scapegoat, which is actually pretty great. I'll have to find a spot for that later. To make matters worse, this was all done with the tacit and at times active permission of the school as a whole, with even teachers joining in the ostracization in order to stave off the curse. That's mad. And well, it gets madder. See, by talking to Mei, Koichi disrupted the ritual which is why the other students all got so worked up when he did. He wonders why, despite them seeming to be on the verge at times, they didn't explain the situation to him. Which, yeah, is a really, really good question, which will be answered right now. I'm going to skip forwards a bit, as I love this. The reason nobody told him was that, 
by telling him to ignore May, they would be acknowledging that May exists, which would also break the ritual. Yeah, a great catch-22, and some very clever writing from Ayatsuji. But, as you can probably guess, this once again is only half the story. What's up with this extra student business? What did May mean by casualty? How many people are going to cark it before they puzzle this one out? Well, we'll have to see next time. Before we finish and you all go out trick-or-treating or toilet papering cars on TikTok or whatever you youngsters do for Halloween these days, I want to give a massive thanks to my patrons. Asterix at Gaming, Cheerful Satanist, Bourrie, Say Rory, Jacob Ramsey, Crazy, Lance Gubel, Piece of Yeast, Rafferty, Robert Dote, and XTC Pill. You chaps and chapettes are amazing. If you want to see more like this, you could always subscribe, and don't forget that bell icon, yada yada yada. If you want to help Mrs. Owl and I out to improve our setup, fund more videos, or afford some safer stairs, go and check out our Patreon. You'll get some fun perks on the Discord, and early access to most of my Fright Ranker videos. Cheers, take care my friends, and I'll see you next time. Happy Halloween, this is The Owl, signing off.